All right, um, Xavier um, Matrian. That's pretty close, yeah. Pretty close. Um, he's a research engineer um, and manager at Netflix. Um, prior, to this, prior to this, he was a senior researcher at Telefonica and also worked as a technical director of the Allosphere project at UC Santa Barbara. Okay, okay. yeah, so thank you very much. So yes, I'm a research and engineering manager at Netflix, and I'm going to be talking today about one of our most valued assets at Netflix, which is our personalization or recommendation. So uh, saying that I come from a company and I'm going to talk about one of our most valued assets, it's my subtle way of saying that I'm not going to be giving too many technical details. Uh, of course, uh, I, I hope that I will make uh, this presentation interesting to you uh, for a different reason, because I'll be talking about the application of machine learning, uh, data streaming processing in the context of uh, customer facing and industrial scale applications such as Netflix. So I think there will be plenty of interesting things in the uh, talk for you. Okay, so uh, how many of you are familiar with the Netflix prize? Hands up. Okay, how many of you actually downloaded the data and played around with it, tried to win the $1 million? Okay, that's pretty good. So for those of you that are not so familiar, let me remind you, this is a contest we put up out at Netflix in 2006. Uh, what we were really interested at that time is how can we <clears throat> make better recommendations. But of course, we had to find a proxy question, something that was measurable, something that we would put a number on, and that's the accuracy in predicted rating. Uh, so whoever was able to improve 10%, the existing method would win $1 million. So here are some details on the contest. There were 100 million ratings on 18,000 movies and around half a million users. And those ratings were from 1999 to 2005. And the contest, uh, you had to predict 2.8 million ratings, which roughly was around six per year. With 10% better RMSC, that was a success metric we chose at that time. Okay, so in 2007, a year later, there was the Progress Prize, uh, the famous Corbell team from at and at that time, improved by 843, so that was getting close to the 10%, using a linear combination of 107 prediction algorithms. Uh, the top two algorithms are those 107, were SVD, so a form of match factorization that probably most of you know, which had a, an RMC on the prize data set of 0 0.89, and RBM, restricted Boltzmann machines, which had an RMC of 0 0.899, so pretty close. The linear blend had an RMC of 0 0.88. So those are two of the 107. So what we did, uh, because we got the source code for that, is we took that source code we went to some of the limitations, for example, the fact that they were designed for 100 million ratings and we had roughly around 5 billion, and they were not adaptable to adding ratings to the users. Uh, it had some performance issues, so we, we went through that, we re-implemented the uh, methods, and those are part of Netflix rating prediction today. Now, the question we get all the time is like, okay, that was the uh, progress price, what about the final ensemble? Because uh, in 2009, so that was two years later, somebody, actually the same team, uh, joined forces with some other teams. They were able to beat the 10%, they won the $1 million, and they added many more algorithms to this 107 they already had. What did you do with that? So the answer to that is we're not using it. <laughs> we're not using it, and there are several reasons for that. The main one was, again, uh, think about the progress price improvement, 8.5% uh, uh, more or less. This was 10%, it was much more complex. The engineering effort we had to do to scale those algorithms was not worth it. Uh, and it was not worth it, not only because of the increase in accuracy, but also because the focus had changed by that time. And the focus on rating prediction was not so important as something else that I will be talking uh, later on uh, through this talk. So just uh, to give you some rough idea, I'm not gonna go through the details, of how Netflix has changed since that time. But basically, here, 2006, we announced the price. That was before we had streaming. That was before we were available on devices, for example. We gave the price here in 2009, and then after that, we, didn't, you know, we went to the iPhone. We went to a bunch of other different countries. We launched uh, the Facebook integration across the world uh, last year. So all these things 
especially the streaming and the devices, change the focus. And now rating prediction is only a very tiny part of what we do in Netflix recommendations. Now, what do we do? I'm going to walk you through uh, the anatomy of Netflix personalization, the kind of data, the kind of uh, algorithms that we use. So for those of you, especially those of you that uh, are not from a country where you have Netflix really uh, available, uh, this is how the website looks. And most of the device devices have a similar look, where we have rows and we have ranking. And something very interesting, we're not personalizing for a single user. We're personalizing for a household. And that adds a bunch of requirements, uh, which are such as diversity, which is something that we need to take into account. So this is the top 10. This is one of the rows we use and one of the algorithms we use to personalize and to give you tailor recommendation. Uh, top 10 already points to a few of the things that we do. For example, we use awareness, or we try to make the user aware of the things that we do to personalize, and that actually increases user engagement. We, we have measured that. We also use diversity. So our algorithm not only tries to maximize a single metric, but it actually tries to play around with the idea of the household and the fact that we're going to have different people looking at this and trying to uh, play from this list. Uh, we support recommendations. So again, algorithms are not only meant to give you the result, but also to give some support and some explanation of why we're recommending something. Uh, rating prediction, for example, now it's more useful as a support metric than actually as a prediction metric. Uh, we, we use things like we, give you, we tell you what we have based this recommendation on. We even use <laughs> social support uh, whenever we recommend something to give you a connected to Facebook. That's outside of the US because it's not available here. OK, uh, social recommendations, the same. It's not available in the US, but we're starting to tap into getting all this stream of data that we get from Facebook connected friends that are watching and are liking whatever you watch. Uh, and the genre rules, this is probably like what most people know when, uh, and realize when, when they start using Netflix, they get all these weird genre roles that are specifically tailored for them, right? And you get like uh, inspired biographic comedies from the uh, 80s, and, and there's like very tailored uh, uh, genres that are made for you. Uh, and those have proven actually to give satisfaction. And again, they're not only giving you a recommendation, they're giving context and evidence and support for what's being recommended. We use implicit uh, input based on your recent place, and we also use explicit based on your taste preferences. That's something, another source of data that we get, users telling us explicitly what kind of genres they use. And diversity, again, and freshness, those are these two other side requirements that we take into account all the time. Similarity is another source of recommendation that you use throughout. Uh, we use machine learning models we have different features, like for example, what, what is similarity, right? Uh, you can think of similarity based on metadata or content. You can use similarity based on ratings, rating patterns, viewing data, all of that. And why not? You can throw all that and learn the concept of similarity in the context where you're actually using it. For example, uh, we use it whenever you add something to your queue. When you search for something, we give you similars. And then we can use the feedback from the user to actually learn what the concept of similarity is using machine learning models. And ranking. And ranking has become sort of like one of our top uh, priorities, uh, much more so than ratings or rating prediction, for example. So think of ranking as storing, sorting, and filtering uh, in a personalized way. So that's kind of like you know, search, what search engines do. But we add the personalization factor, which is also available in many search engines. But the goal here is to find the best possible ordering for a user within a specific context and in real time. That's also very important because we need to take into account the user intent. Uh, the objective is to maximize consumption. And this is something similar to the uh, CTR click-through rate prediction for ads or search, except, except that it adds a little tweak. Because we're not only interested in you clicking on something, but it actually clicking and watching, and then coming back and watching again. So that adds some uh, extra requirements on our objective function. Uh, and you can think about it. If, you, if we get you to click many times, but you don't end up watching whatever you clicked on, 
that's a very bad sign, right? So we don't want uh, we don't want to fool you into clicking things that you don't end up liking. Uh, we take into account again factors like accuracy, novelty, diversity, frank, uh, freshness, and so on. So the obvious baseline for ranking is popularity. If I you know if I knew nothing and I had to guess for each one of you in the room what you were going to like. I would just go to my list, look at the most popular stuff on Netflix, and give you, each one of you, exactly the same list. Because chances are that the most popular stuff is what most people are going to click on or are going to watch. Uh, what happens when you add ratings? Well, when you add ratings as an input to ranking, you are personalizing, but you're also increasing your uh, accuracy of your ranking. Yes? Sir, what is Uh, what does that mean? So we what use, yeah, we use uh, many offline metrics, but since we're talking about ranking, think of this metric as a uh, typical metric that you would use in ranking, which is uh, MR, MRR, mean reciprocal rank, NECG, uh, okay. uh, something like that, fraction of concordant pairs, roughly they're all the same, right? But uh, any of these metrics are going to give you uh, roughly the same. So we add ratings. And then uh, we increase around 25, 30%. And of course, we add many other features. Now, all these other features that come from the data that I'll be showing you afterwards are just data that we can add to our uh, real-time uh, machine learned models to increase the accuracy. And this is an increase 200% versus the uh, probability baseline. And if we do a little of parameter tuning, we go a little bit over 220%. Okay, so that leads me to data and models, and I'm going to go quickly through a bunch of different data that we use uh, to do this ranking and to do this uh, personalization. So ratings, we have 5 billion ratings, 4 million ratings a day. We have popularities. The concept of popularity, forget about the global popularity I was talking about. We, have, we can uh, make up as many as we want. We can have cluster popularities for different clusters of users. We can have daily, we can have weekly, we can have regional. Uh, we can base our popularity computations on as many concepts as we want and use that as real-time data streams that go into our models. Uh, the plays, we get 30 million plays a day with start, stop, pause, continue, all that information can be fed into our machine learning uh, models. Item metadata, this is the content side, so we get all this information about every single item in our catalog. Presentation. It's not only about what people actually play, it's what people actually scroll through, whether they uh, uh, stay in a uh, particular view for more seconds or less, whether they hit, uh, they click back on their browser, or they just go over and hover over some uh, movie to see the details. All of that information can be used uh, as feedback to the algorithms. Social feedback, I already mentioned, and many others. All of these are features, Q data, search data, demographics, location, country, language, time of the day, season, all of that goes into our models. And then <clears throat> what about models? The data, all of that, what kind of models we use. And here I'm just listing a, a few of the ones that we typically use. I'm not going to give many details, but uh, you can think uh, both logistic and linear regression, uh, elastic nets, which is a very uh, interesting generalized linear model. Uh, using uh, both L1 and L2 regularization, uh, which is an extension of logistic or linear regression. SVD, I already mentioned, and RBMs, <coughs> Markov chains, uh, different clustering and other non-supervised approaches like LDA, association rules, GBDTs, and other tree-based method methods like random forest. All of this comes into play uh, using the data that I mentioned before. Okay, so is it about more data or better models? How am I doing on time? Okay. So I think this is an interesting question because uh, it, it comes uh, time and time again. And for example, when during the Netflix trial, there was this post by Anand Rajaraman uh, from Stanford and now at uh, Walmart uh, saying more data usually beats better algorithms. And they were talking about the Netflix prize, and he was talking about how his students had taken some data from IMDb, content-based based data, and had improved the results of polarity filtering. Well, uh, that was during the trials. Again, I don't know the date exactly. But is that really so? 
So later on, uh, after the Netflix prize, we had a publication that said exactly the opposite. So recommending new movies, even if your ratings are more valuable than metadata. So what this publication was saying, it's like, forget about adding more metadata or more data related to the content. It's really not worth it. Just a few ratings, and they were showing how a few ratings in a well-tuned collaborative filtering environment was not really do, adding it much to the precision uh, of, a, of the collaborative filtering setting. Uh, so sometimes it's not really about more data. So another uh, uh, paper that people bring up, or another uh, thing that people bring, bring up when they're discussing about more data versus algorithms is uh, you know, Norbit saying that Google does not have better algorithms, it only has better data. And there's this uh, publication, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data, that's related to this uh, talk by Peter Norvig. There's also the famous uh, paper by Banco and Brill in 2001, when they're basically shown uh, for a language model that really very different models have similar performance, and they only really respond to how many millions of words they're being trained on in terms of what's the accuracy of the model. So the models really perform the same. So again, the question is, we don't need to worry so much about the model. It's just about adding more data. Is that really the case, right? So you have to remember that in both of these cases, they're talking about language models, where you have low bias models and many, many features. And in those cases, it's reasonable to think that the more data that you add, the more uh, dimensions, uh, uh, sorry, the more examples you add to a high dimensional space, the more accuracy you're gonna get. But that's not always the case. So just to give you a counter example, this is the current uh, Netflix uh, ranking system, and this is the number of training examples that we use, and this is the performance accuracy we get. So basically, as you can see, the model separates very quickly, uh, roughly, so this is uh, one million examples, roughly around 300,000 examples, it's saturated, and we don't need to use uh, more than that. Because in dimensionality of the feature space, we have done some dimensionality reduction previously using non-supervised models, and we don't need to have uh, that many training examples at that point. So again, sometimes it's not, more, it's not about more data. It's about how to be smart with the data that you have. I like to uh, sort of unquote this uh, uh, article by Chris Anderson, what he was saying, the end of theory, the data deluge makes scientific method obsolete. And, and this cross that he was putting here, I put it on uh, his article <laughs> and said, okay, that's not really the case. What I'm saying is, you know, data without sound approach is noise. So you, yeah, it's very good that we have more data, and the more data we have, the better. But that doesn't mean that our algorithms and our scientific method is obsolete. It's probably the other way around. You need to be even smarter to know how, what to do with that data. So, uh, some conclusions. So the Netflix prize simplified the recommendation problem to predicting ratings, but as I mentioned, user ratings are only part of uh, our many inputs, and they're only uh, a small part of the problem, and now we are looking into many, many different uh, sides of the different question. And so we have reformulated the recommendation problem and the function to optimize is the probability that the user chooses something and chooses to watch it and likes it enough to actually come back to the service. And that's a complicated function to optimize, I can tell you that. Uh, and on the discussion about data or models, you know, more data availability obviously enables better results. Uh, more data without a good approach, though, is noise. So we need to define optimization functions and metrics that enable fast experimentation. And something that we can do in industry, which is, uh, uh, we're fortunate enough that we can do, is we can allow the user to be the final judge. So we basically have uh, functions that we optimize offline in all these machine learning models. We get our offline metrics, and we have a notion, an intuition of whether it's gonna work or not. But at the end, we let the user, through A-B testing, uh, answer the question whether model A is better than model B. And the cool thing, which we're trying to do, we're still not 100% there, then we want to correlate those offline metrics that I was saying before, like MRR, fraction of concordant pairs, MDCG, all of them, we're trying to build a predictive model that actually predicts the response we're going to get from the user. And that's the ultimate frontier of what we, we really want to be. We want, want to be able to predict how well a model will do once we 
launch it and we roll it out to the users by doing experiments offline in the lab. Okay, so that's uh, the conclusion of my talk. Thank you very much. recent uh, absolutist statement on the lines of, uh, we don't need theory, but the kind of A-B testing is good for everything. And you can just, you don't have to even bother to figure out whether something works for a user, just run A-B testing automatically, and it'll let it figure out what's the right way to present the data to the user. And since you mentioned various testing methodologies here, I'm curious if you would push back against that as well, based on your experience in that place. I would. Uh, is this recording going to be public? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So, uh, A-B testing is the, you know, has the ultimate answer. The, pro the problem with A-B testing is it's very expensive and very slow. And I can give you an example. We've had, we had some uh, linear model that was being used in production and have been kind of optimized. The weights have been optimized by doing A-B testing. What optimized means is that basically there have been a sample of the space saying, oh, let's try with this weight, let's try with this other weight, let's run A-B test and let these guys what works better. Uh, we, um, pretty recently, like uh, three years ago, we actually did a machine learning model to learn those weights, and we said, forget about this uh, model, of the, this weight that we learned to A-B testing, let's do an offline machine learning model, and let's A-B test it against the other one. So this model actually had the highest gain in all of Netflix history in terms of measure uh, by user uh, if, uh, engagement. And you can say, of course, you know, if you had infinite resources, infinite users, and infinite time to run A-B tests with every single possible combination of your parameters that you're going to roll out, then I would say, okay, maybe, yeah, go ahead and do it. But I don't know any company that has that. And I don't think it makes sense. <coughs> what makes sense is to make a good offline optimization, sample the problem space, maybe come up with a reasonable, say, okay, uh, the, 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 the biggest issue with offline testing and the reason why it's not the ultimate answer is just because we're still lacking this perfect correlation between the offline metrics and what we see then with the users. And sometimes we, we even surprise ourselves and say, oh, I had two models, this one got better, whatever, MRR, and now it turns out that users prefer this other one. So what did we do wrong? So we're trying to fine tune this correlation but if we have that, that would be the perfect thing. Like we want to do things offline. A-B test is a good confirmation, but it's not reasonable to expect to optimize. Um, Moltes gracias. Uh, so <laughs> I wanted to uh, ask a couple of questions. So I'll start with, the, I think, the biggest one. Um, I guess recommendation engines are a sort of big business now in general, and obviously Netflix has been way ahead of the game for a long time when it comes to sort of consumer-facing work. Um, is the fact that you're not using sort of third-party recommendation engines uh, mostly a statement about how unbelievably important the main knowledge is that, you know, obviously you, you've got your own internal group to be able to do this, but if I now think about Netflix maybe pushing out the recommendation engines you've built, is the idea essentially that there, there is no sort of uh, one way to do this right, um, not just in terms of the algorithm, but the whole framework for how you do the testing. Yeah. Well, that's part of the reason, but I wouldn't say it's the main reason. I think the main reason is because we think that recommendations, personalization is so core to the business that we need to own it. Basically, I mean, Eric Smith from Google said uh, a few months ago, he said something like, Netflix wouldn't exist today without the, the, the recommendation algorithm. I don't know, I wouldn't go so far, but the truth is that 75% of what people watch from, from the personalization and the recommendation we have a limited catalog, and we have to really be good on presenting each user whatever the, uh, uh, what the user likes in a particular context, a particular time. So this is kind of like, it's like uh, Google's secret sauce for the, for the algorithm. It's not about uh, saying, oh, we use space and everybody can use it, right? There's something else, and uh, yeah, there is some domain knowledge, but it's mostly about, it's really like, the core of our business, business is the recommendation side. So uh, that's the reason why we don't want to either outsource it, base it on, on, base it on third party solutions, or talk into many details about it. 
the other thing I was just going to make a comment, um, which I'll give you uh, for free, is uh, something that I think can lift um, all of us uh, very well, which is to use one uh, piece of metadata, which I'm pretty sure you're not using now, which is the time when I'm looking at my recommendations, because at 11 p.m. I don't want to see Dora. <laughs> That's a very, that's a very uh, fair point, and uh, uh, I agree with you. You, you wouldn't be surprised of, of what people want to do at the end. I think. A quick question about one of the minor things you showed at the beginning in, in the matrix uh, of Rose by ranking, and you sort of said, oh, this is for you know, dad, mom, child, Bob. How do you go about improving the composition of the household? Uh, we, do, we don't do an explicit inference of that, but we do an implicit one. So we, we don't really know whether you have two kids, a uh, daughter and a son, uh, or uh, you're married or not. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we base, uh, so many of our you know, uh, solutions are based on some previous unsupervised learning methods that we use to cluster users or find taste clusters and then assign households to those. And that's kind of, we, we just know that you're roughly in an area, and that means that in your house, it's probably people from that cluster. <coughs> Any more questions? All right, let's um, thank you. Thank you.